everyone. Happy October Awareness Month. My name is Dr. Katherine Garforth of Garforth Education. And all throughout October, we're going live at five o'clock to help bring awareness to the different awareness months that it is. And today we're focusing on attention deficit disorder. And I have my friend and fellow advocate, Chantel, and she is the on the board members of the BC Ed Access. And today we're going to be talking about women and ADHD. So Chantel, why don't you take a little bit to tell us about yourself? Um, so I'm a mom of two. Um, my eldest uh, is 12 and my youngest is eight. Um, they both have been diagnosed with ADHD. Oh. And um, so that's kind of led me down my path of discovery. Um, as I, I'm sure it's happened to a lot of women um, in this world. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, that's, <laughs> it's funny. I'm trying to think of like, where do I go from here? There's so many beginnings, you know, when you, when you get into this is um, you start to think, okay, this is, you know, something about yourself. Right. And uh I think some of the biggest aha moments was when I'm talking to people with ADHD about their ADHD. And I'm just like, yeah, that kind of sounds really, really, really familiar. <laughs> and like, we're talking and we're both like jumping out of the conversation and jumping into something else and then jumping back in again. And then when I do it to people who are neurotypical, they're like, why do you keep interrupting me? And you can just kind of see a look on their face. Like, can you please just stop interrupting me and like talking about something completely different? <laughs> and so I'll just have to stop and think, okay, I need to get back to what I was talking about earlier. And that's um, being a woman who probably has ADHD. But unfortunately, um, I was actually on the path to getting a diagnosis and um, it, it's been quite a path to get there. Um, I started um, over a year ago and um, unfortunately we moved right after I found a really great doctor. Um, she was totally, she gave me all the paperwork and she's like, yeah, you probably do have it, but let's just do this filling, just filling out this paperwork and stuff like that. Uh, then we moved. And so uh, we moved to like a completely different area with like terrible healthcare system <laughs> and there's no doctors. So now I'm kind of in limbo and um, I asked the guy on telehealth, you know, the Babylon TELUS thing. I'm like, hey, buddy. So uh, uh, I have want to go for a diagnosis of ADHD. Do you think you could do that for me? He's like, um, I'm only allowed 10 minutes to talk to patients. And it has to be like very just, you know, regular stuff. She, he goes, you have to go to a walk-in clinic. I'm like, during COVID? What? Yeah. So I'm at that point right now where that's where I'm at. And uh it's complicated, um, especially when you have children, um, especially when you have to make appointments and your scheduling is, is so crazy and wacky that you're so tired. You really just don't want to get up and go to a walk-in clinic to explain yourself again to a complete stranger. Um, I really wish that there was a better system for women. Um, guys usually get diagnosed early on, although there some of my family members were diagnosed at like 40 um, and I'm 43. So um, it's not a surprise that I'm, I'm going for it as well. Yeah. yeah, well, and I guess there's also the fact that typically um, men have the ADHD impulsive hyperactive subtype yeah. or the comorbid of, um, sorry, the combined condition of ADHD hyperactive and impulsive and inattentive. Yeah. Whereas women, we typically exhibit the inhibition, or sorry, not the inattention. Inattention, inattentive. Inattentive. totally. Yes, yes. exactly. Yep. Uh, and that's a little bit harder to assess and more difficult because a lot of people are still focused on that hyperactivity and the impulsiveness of ADHD. Yes and don't put the same focus on the inattention and what it's like to have ADD or ADHD when it's an inattentive thing. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for people to get a glimpse of what exactly is happening in your mind. Okay. Um, and a lot of the, the forms that you fill out are more towards the hyperactive and impulsive and it's, it's harder to diagnose as an adult because as an adult, 
you typically develop more coping mechanisms right. and coping skills, yep. right? So even though it's affecting you, you've developed your strategies to deal with it. That's right. Exactly. And then finding a practitioner that has the, the knowledge and the specialty available to work with adults because with it, with children, it's, it's easier because they don't have as many strategies and coping mechanisms built in. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely worth going for that diagnosis. I know when we spoke with Ted Lovett last week, he talked about all, all the suggestions that he had mm -hmm. and how, you know, he's written a book, uh, Teddy hit me. And I know mm -hmm. reading that book can be very revealing. Yes. Uh, it's like, Oh, that totally makes sense. And it just starts yeah. clicking. Yeah, right? it does. Yeah. Well, it's funny. Um, I asked you earlier, um, when Ted had, um, spoken and it was October 1st. Right. And yeah. I completely forgot that he was speaking. What a surprise shocker. Um, but I've actually interviewed him as well because I, I used to be a radio programmer for civil radio. And um, <laughs> one of my aha moments was when I was interviewing him. And we we're getting into a great conversation. It was just so great. I was like, yeah, that's great. Blah, blah. And then I looked down at my recorder and I realized I never turned it on. <laughs> so we were talking the whole time. It was a record. Like, yeah, can you just repeat everything you just said <laughs> for the last 10 minutes? <laughs> uh, it was great. We had a good laugh. Um, but yeah, that's, that's really it. Um, I think that uh, adults really need to like, we have a hard time stopping and kind of thinking about our inner selves, right? Like once you start to stop and think, okay, like, why is this so hard for me to do this? Like, why is it so hard for me to finish this work? Am I just lazy? Like, these are questions that roll around in your head and you start to call yourself lazy. So, you know, I'm a big procrastinator. Well, through my kids, through knowing, trying to help them. I'm not the greatest helper. I don't have a lot of patience um, and I get distracted easily. Um, I, I tell them to do certain things and I'm like, well, why aren't I doing those things? Why, why am I telling them to do it? And I'm not doing it myself. So now I've started to break things down and look at it and go, why is this really hard for me to do? Like this, this stupid paperwork, I can do all this paperwork, but this paperwork, no, it's too hard. Well, it's because it's an unknown. It's probably paperwork I've never done before. Um, when you have kids with special needs, there's just a mountain of paperwork all the time, but it's the same questions over and over. Right. Um, but when you go to do new paperwork or, uh, new questions that are coming up or a new job or a new task or something like that, it's hard to envision yourself doing it and then finishing it. And, and you think there's so many steps in between and there usually is. Um, and that can be very, uh, barrier that can be create quite quite a barrier for someone um to even just start doing that work um i've got a few things in the back of my head that are like poking me and going you know you could have done that two months ago <laughs> like i don't want to do it <laughs> yeah it's all about that task initiation and oh. just getting that little push over and um, yeah. I know personally, I find bullet journaling to be a huge benefit. Okay. What, what do you mean by that? What, uh, bullet journaling is a method of breaking down tasks into individual steps. So if you're looking at an okay. IEP, you have the goal and you have the objectives. Yes. So the bullet journal breaks it down into those individual measurable objectives. Okay. And it allows you to see it and have it very visually represented. Okay. So. Oh, and like, you can track habits and I know like one spread yeah. that I have is things that I can do in 15 minutes or less right and a lot of them are household chores like wiping down the counters sweeping the kitchen <laughs> mopping the floor and yeah. you know you have all these inhibitions where it's like that's just such a big task but really it only takes you like 15 minutes or less yes and if you have a goal of getting three of those 15 minute or less things done in a day yes. yeah and you can have some pictorial representation of getting them done mm. just the gratification that that gives you 
Yeah, that's a good idea. And then making your, like as you would for um, kids that have problems with sequencing and planning, you have a visual schedule, Mm -hmm. right? So it gives you, okay, so this is what I'm doing on Mondays and you have tasks set out that you need to do every Monday. And it just makes Mm -hmm. it more visual, more apparent and routine based. Yeah. Routine based is big one. Um, I've, I've learned that, um, when I talk about my kids preferred and non-preferred activities, the non-preferred is very hard to get them to do. So I started to look at my own non-preferred activities and how can I make them more preferred activities? (laughs) Like, Mm -hmm. what can I do to make myself feel good while I'm doing this? You know, like, does music help me? Does, you know, aromatherapy help me? Like, um, does lighting help? Because I started to realize sensi- sensory issues in myself, yeah. um, in my whole family, we all have, you know, our things that really bother us. And so that I try to bring that in as well um, when I do these things. But I think um, one of the biggest hurdles is not getting it done and then feeling shame for that, which is a huge issue. I know a lot of people have, um, I know I have it and in abundance. (laughs) So it's great. (laughs) But yes, you're right. Like if you have a list and you can cross off like one or two of those things and you know that you're only going to cross off one or two of those things, that's really helpful too. When I I find when I have a list, the really big, long 10 item list, and that's usually like what I have to get done within that week, right? Um, That bothers me a lot because I can only cross off like one or two. And then I'm like, well, I should have gotten it all done. You know, I shouldn't have spent so much time on Facebook or I shouldn't have gone and checked my emails and, you know, uh, read my book for half an hour. So it's, it's an interesting thing as an adult because it looks so different than with children um, and how we do things and how we get things done and the expectations that are placed upon us. Um, you know, like when you get a letter in the agenda for school, like, um, please send Timmy home with microphones or uh, with headphones and money for the agenda. And, you know, it takes you about five days and they write it in there every single day. <laughs> please do this now. I'm like, oh my gosh. Well, the funny part is, is I actually did it. I, I did the thing that the agenda told me to do, but my son didn't know or didn't remember. And he said he never got them and he didn't bother to look at his back. So it's like this perfect storm. <laughs> it's well, great. It's all about finding how to set yourself up for success. And then mm-hmm. another strategy is when you create lists mm-hmm. is having the must do, should do, and would like to do. Yes. And then only that's planning on having three things completed in one day. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good right. point. And, you know, having, okay, so these are the three things that I have to get done today. Mm-hmm. And yes, there are other things that I'd like to do, but I'm not mm-hmm. expecting myself to complete those. And then some days you're going to be super productive and you'll be able to get them all done. Yeah. And then other days just getting dressed is hard enough. Yep. That's true. That's why I really env- envy those um, entrepreneurs, the big CEOs and stuff like that, they say that um, some of the most successful actually wear the same clothes every day. So they don't have to change. They don't have to think about that. They don't have to put any effort into what they're wearing. And I thought that was just such a great idea. I'd love to to do that. <laughs> I just, I love variety. I love novelty. <laughs> then, then plan your clothes out for the week. Yes. Sunday. yes. Plan, so this is what I'm wearing every day. You know what? I I have a very, um, I've been get definitely drifting more into a very set, uh, clothes that I like to wear and that's it. That's all I'm buying now. Like I only wear like leggings, um, or like my, my nice jogging pants sort of thing. Um, I only wear tunic tops. A lot of them have to have pockets in them. So it's just basically finding ones that match and I put them together and it's, unless I don't do my laundry, I'm pretty set for that. So it's pretty good. I don't worry too much anymore. Not like I used to. I'm becoming more of an adult, I guess. <laughs> well, and that, that's the thing that we need to remember that uh, for neurodiverse individuals, there is, 
leg doesn't sound like the right word, but it, it's what it is. The, the maturity level just takes that much longer to reach. So yeah. where executive functioning, which are the CEO of your brain, typically start developing in neurotypical individuals at age five, it's not until age eight or 10 that they begin developing in the neurodiverse group. And that means that when in a neurotypical individual, they're not fully developed until about age 25. It means that not until your thirties that these are fully right. developed and formed. And then you still can work on these skills. Yeah, exactly. It means it's formed, but it's not, you haven't made the right connections yet for the tools that you need. Right. So you're like, okay, if we're the brains like, okay. And now, now we can start creating a better system for you. Like now we're fully uploaded and now we can start to really, I found that 35, 40 is when I started to like, okay, I'm, I'm sort of getting into a better flow. Um, and then I think the past year is really when I've kind of figured things out a bit more, you know? Well, and the world's always changing, right? And the demands are always changing. <laughs> and as sure. your children, children get older, your demands as a mother gets changed and it's not yeah. feed, eat, you know, change. Yes. Do that new parenting. True. It's not just, yeah. you know, nap, feed, bottle. Pure survival, basically. Yeah. yeah. That's a very really good point. And then yeah. you get to come into your own more as an individual when those demands yeah. on you aren't every, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour. That's right. So now you're having more extended periods where you can actually focus on something. Exactly. That's very true. So what steps did you take to pursuing the diagnosis yourself? Because you mentioned that you're, you're still not there. Yeah, yeah. But we're finally able to get it started before you move. So how did you find yeah. that whole process? It's more by chance than anything else. Um, I had, um, she was known at the Surrey uh, walk-in clinic. Um, she only came on certain days to do uh, pap tests for women, right? So she was very women oriented. Um, you can make an appointment. Well, actually it was a walk-in pap test clinic, which was kind of a good thing because you didn't have to make an appointment a month in advance and then have to cancel because you have something happening. Right. right. Um, but you also had to schedule your time to have proper childcare to go in on that day and then spend like three hours waiting to get your pap test done. Right. So I happened to go there because somebody had mentioned that this was happening and um, that was like two years before that or a year before that or something. And um, we got to talking, me and the, me and the doctor and like, we got to talking for a long time. <laughs> <We couldn't stop. laughs> and she told me how she has ADHD, her daughter has ADHD and, and stuff like that. So it was just really fantastic to hear a doctor talk about it and to really understand what it is as a woman. And um, so that kind of planted a seed in my head. And um, as time went on, I'm like, you know, this is, I, I see people doing stuff and they're getting a lot more done than I am. <laughs> like, I just seem to like jump from thing to thing to thing. And um, I'd really like to understand why, right? And by that time, I was interviewing people for it with ADHD. Um, you know, I knew more about my own kids um, and stuff like that. So I started to look into it, and then I'm like, you know what? I'm thinking I'm gonna go see her and um, see if she could do um, a test or whatever. And so I went in and I waited my full hours. And I'm gonna tell you probably from the time that I thought, hey, maybe I should go see her for that to the time I actually saw her was probably six months. So, you know, uh, I think ADHD is in itself a barrier to getting diagnosed with ADHD um, because there's so much that's involved, especially with our system that we have. It's not just picking up a phone. I mean, saying, hey, I'd like an appointment to get a, a diagnosis or whatever. It, it's quite a bit more than that, right? you got child care, you have if you're working, then you got to take time off work. And it's just, it's a whole thing. Right. And then what if you don't get to see that person at that time? What if something happens anyway? So I got in to see her and she's like, well, I technically don't do ADHD diagnoses. She goes, but I probably could do you. <laughs> <She's> pretty obvious. <laughs> but um, she goes here, take this paperwork home, come back and see me. She says, come back and see me in one month. You have to come back and see me in one month. 
I said, yeah, 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 totally. I'll see you in one month. <laughs> I didn't go back because, um, yeah, by the time I was like, okay, I got to go back. I got to do this. Um, we had found out that we were moving and um, I had to uh, do a lot to get that done. And now we're here in Nanaimo. So, yeah, it's been interesting. And we moved in September of this last year and we finally moved into our house in December and then COVID happened in March. So it's been, yeah, something interesting. And there's only two walk-in clinics in this whole town. So <laughs> good luck. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right. Now, how do you think it is for mothers with ADHD that adds that added level of complication to being a parent? There's, it. it's so interesting because like, Last, not last year, but the year before, my kid, both my kids were in school and one was in grade six. The other one was in grade two. No, one, one, grade one. And um, so they both had different levels of education that were happening and different levels of activities that they were doing inside the school and outside the school. Um, you know, my, my eldest was in therapy sessions, um, like occupational therapy and stuff like that. So I had to like, you know, pick them both up and, and get them to that session or whatever. And it was just, I felt like a hot mess the whole damn time. <laughs> like, seriously, it was just like, how do people do it with more than one, two, one kid? Like I have two, they're great kids. They both have ADHD though. And I probably do too. And it's like a scatter house in the mornings, right? Like, like it's just, and then I'm having to, to do executive functioning for one kid and then I have to do executive functioning for another kid and then I have to do executive functioning for myself. And that is the kicker right there. Like if I could get my shit together, then I could probably get their stuff together a lot more. Um, there's a lot of things they probably missed out on because um, I didn't get around to it. I didn't get around to the paperwork. I didn't get around to calling. Um, I hate the phone. Like I really hate the phone. Um, I hate making phone calls. Uh, that could be because of my bill collector days back when I was very young. Um, so I feel bad that there are probably some things that they missed out on because of it. Um, you know, there's so much to running a household. Um, we've been privileged enough that I was able to stay home. I mean, I couldn't, I, honestly, I couldn't handle working and taking care of two kids. <laughs> I would have burnt out really quick. Um, I did try it for the first while, but um, it didn't work out. And so we were really lucky that I could stay home. I could figure this stuff out, but my husband worked away a lot. And so I was basically a single parent um, as well um, with no really family around. So it was really um, an interesting uh, experience. <laughs> I'll say that. Um, once I moved to, I moved to Mission in 2016 and we started making friends and connections in the community and stuff like that. And that was a really big help. I found that as a mother, having other mothers helping was so much better. Um, I really wish we could all come together a lot more as a community. I think um, we wouldn't struggle as parents as much um, if we could have the community back us up a lot more instead of just calling us, you know, a hot mess and like, oh, look at her, she can't take care of her kids or whatever, or, you know, that's kind of that kind of stuff, right? The parent shaming sort of thing. Um, I think we could all do better, right? It, that would be, that would be nice. But yeah, so I think it's, it's a hell of a lot more difficult um, juggling it all. Um, right now, one kid is in school full-time and the other one is in distributed learning. He's been in distributed learning for over a year now. So, and he really likes that. And, um, but it's the two separate programs now. One is in school. So you have that whole school environment and then you have the whole distributed learning environment, which for the first few weeks was just like, I don't even know how, I'm, but luckily they're all kind of, um, we've staggered it enough that it's not too big of a overwhelming project because we've learned not to do that. <laughs> don't, don't do too many activities. And um, COVID has helped as well, actually, to tell you the honest truth, to lessen the expectations um, on what we do and where we go um, and how we do these things. I'm actually kind of liking it a little bit 
um, there isn't those assumptions anymore, um, which has actually been kind of nice. Yeah, well, and the other thing that you haven't necessarily mentioned, but in a house where there's more than one individual that has something like ADHD, it's you have to kind of mesh those strength and weakness profiles, right? And figure out where one person excels and another person is weak. And it's hard, especially when you have your own strengths and weaknesses. If they're similar to your children's, mm -hmm. then you're not the best one to help with the intervention because it's an area that your weakness is in. Exactly. So it, it's trying to figure out how best to work the situation given everybody's profiles. That's right. And I think it's important that parents in general become more honest about the situation that they're in and not worry about being Pinterest perfect or Facebook pretty or Instagram, whatever it is, mm -hmm. because it puts the expectations that much higher for everyone else mm -hmm. and makes the failure feel bigger. Yes. Right. Yes. And the shaming and figuring you know, oh, I'm not as good in so-and-so when really we all have our own strengths. And yes, I may be able to throw together a great family meal, but, mm -hmm. you know, getting the laundry folded and put away <laughs> is a struggle, right? Exactly. Exactly. It can be in the clean laundry basket. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Whereas other people, you know, putting together a meal for 20 people, that would be like impossible. Mm -hmm. So it's knowing your strengths sure. and weaknesses and knowing where to use the community as a support for that. Exactly. Exactly. Well, this year we didn't want to put my youngest um, back into school full time, but I knew from last year because we had done distributed learning with him last year because we had moved and we didn't know where we we're going to be. So I said, well, let's just homeschool for the year and then see how that goes. And I'm like, nope, nope. I've learned I cannot do it if if I do have to do it that's fine, but, um, it's not going to be great at all, like at all. So that's why we put him in. Cause I'm like, there's just, I can't, I can't do what other people can do. That's not, that's not me. I can't teach him. And we also have our different personalities, right? So it's not, <laughs> that doesn't work so great either. Well, it's hard to be the parent and the teacher, the yeah. parent and the, the facilitator. Yes. And that's one thing that I think parents, need to realize and not feel guilty if it's something that doesn't work for them. Mm -hmm. Your primary role is the caregiver and the nurturer of that child. And that child doesn't want you to see them fail. Yeah, that's a good point. And they don't want you to see them struggle. They want to show you their mm -hmm. best side and it's embarrassing and difficult. Mm -hmm. And if it's something that's stressing your relationship as a parent and a child, then it's something that you should remove from that relationship. Totally. That's exactly it. That's really exactly it. Yeah. Yeah, so for sure. What advice would you give other women who are thinking they may actually have ADHD? How would you suggest they go forward? Are there any groups or resources that you'd recommend? Well, I would, I would reach out to other um, women with ADHD. Um, there's some really great pages out there. There's some private pages out as well, um, like progressive uh, ADHD women. Um, it's just an absolutely fantastic Facebook page that I've, I've um, fallen into. <laughs> um, but um, I would really do the self-assessment online. Um, I would talk to other ADHD people. Um, I'd listen to Ted Levitt. Actually, um, his stuff is just really good. There's a lot to chew on there. Um, and uh, I would really just start making phone calls. I know, and I know, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it so much and I need to do it too. But we need to, f I almost wonder if there shouldn't be like a web page that says ADHD for women in BC. This is what, these, these are the people you can go to because it's so unknown yet. There's only like one or two doctors that I've heard of that are very specialized in it. Um, and that will take you for an appointment that doesn't cost you an arm and a leg. Um, you can go to psychologists and stuff like that, but they can't prescribe. Psychologists cannot prescribe. So if you're looking for medication um, that you, you can go there for an assessment, but you won't be able to get 
your your medications. So um, I really wish telehealth or Babylon Health would change their system and make it more accessible for assessments um, when it comes to adults. Um, I think that with ADHD, you don't need to be in person as an adult um, to speak with someone about your ADHD. I don't, I don't like as a child, they want to observe and blah, blah, blah. But do they really need to observe you as an adult? Like most of us can keep our hands to ourselves and, you know, not knock the tower of blocks over. So, um, well, and again, there's that difference between yeah. inattentive and the hyperactive impulsive. So much, so much. This is exactly what Ted Levin and I were talking about is we need to create mm -hmm. some resource that has it available for individuals to say, look, I have ADHD, where should I go? What should yeah. I do? Yeah. So that there's more of a direct line to service. Totally. Yeah. Cause most of the sites are for children. Uh, most ADHD websites, you like even Kadak and stuff like that. Like they barely talk about adults. Uh, Attitude magazine um, is now they're, they're starting to more talk about uh, adult experiences, which is really great. Um, so they're getting more on board with that, but I, I think there just needs to be something BC based, something that, you know, talks to adults now, here and now, you know, not um, an association or whatever. I, I guess you need to have that structure if you're gonna do that, if you're gonna put out resources, but can we just simplify it, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, can well, it just be simple? <laughs> the thing is once these adults, whether they be male or female, find out about their ADHD and they're able to get the supports that they need, life can just be that much better. Yes, right? so much. Uh... If you have the support that you need to succeed and you're able to figure out the strategies that you need to help make your day more successful, to become more productive and to be able to you know, work on those executive functioning and the emotional regulation, and have the supports, it means that life will be more successful for everyone. And we won't have yeah. the same crises that are happening around us. Exactly. And exactly. there are so many comorbid conditions or co-occurring oh, yeah. conditions with ADHD that having the ADHD in control really helps. Uh, and especially like one of a, a very common one is sleep issues for individuals with ADHD. And it's just that ability where you can't turn your brain off to fall asleep because there's always that idea yeah. that's coming to you in the middle of, oh, I got to do that. If I don't do it now, I'm going to forget about it. Yep, exactly. Exactly. I've heard that um, keeping a book and a pen, piece of paper and a pen next to your bed is a really good idea. Um, for sleeping, for me, um, I, I like reading books, but lately I found that reading books actually puts me to sleep. So that's a great thing. Um, <laughs> um, so in the middle of the night, if I, if I wake up, um, I go and I read a book and I, I highly suggest to people, uh, not to sit and ruminate about what it is that you're thinking about and try to distract yourself from it. I, I that's such a blase thing to say, and I don't mean to make it sound as shallow as it sounds, but I think that, um, we need to find something that we can be passionate about that gives us focus. Um, when we really enjoy something, we don't think about anything else. We, you know, focus on that passion. And for re for me, reading takes me out of my head and um, allows me to kind of think of other things. So I'll start thinking about, you know, that. I like a lot of, you know, murder mysteries and things. So I'll start to think about like, oh, who did it? And, you know, how did this happen or whatever? And um, stuff like that. So I think that's, um kind of a good thing to, to do um audiobooks is really great especially if, if you have any um reading issues um that's a really great one actually podcasts things like that um well and that's the other thing that we haven't brought up is that one thing that people will often think of oh, well i can't have adhd because when i'm doing this I can concentrate, no problem. Mm -hmm. And that's a misnomer because it's it's considered being in the zone. And yeah. when you're in your passion, you're able to block everything, but then you often also get time blindness. 
Oh yeah. So you're completely yeah. oblivious to how much time has passed while you're doing that activity mm -hmm. because you're so hyper-focused. And that doesn't mean that you don't have ADHD. It just means that you're in your zone doing That's something right. that you can focus on and enjoy. And, you know, if you're lucky, you're able to have that thing be your profession. Yes. Right. Yes. That's what they say is uh, they, the professionals, the researchers, the studies show that if you do the thing that you're passionate about, you're more likely to be successful at it as a job. So um, that is so important for people to understand. It's actually a symptom of ADHD when you're able to, to zone it, to be in the zone for, yeah. for long periods of time and like completely forget about your surroundings around you and time and things like that. It's, uh, that's a really good point. A really good point. Yeah. Yeah. Right now I'm passionate about um, decorating for Halloween. So yes, I picked up a couple of decorations today and nice. uh, do, you know, do you remember shrinky dinks? Did you ever do shrinky? No, it was like the plastic that you color with a Sharpie and then you put it in the oven and then it shrinks to a smaller yes. size. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, um, some of my kids struggle with fine motor skills and getting them to draw anything can be challenging, mm -hmm. but if you do a shrinky dink and it shrinks, well, that's just too exciting. Ooh. So we've been doing those and making them Halloween decorations. Nice. So that's, that's been lots of fun. That sounds awesome. Yeah. So I want to thank you for coming on. And I also wanted you to give you the opportunity to tell everyone listening about BC Ed Access because it's oh. an amazing group mm -hmm. and you're an expert on it. And so <laughs> it's better that you talk about it than myself. Yeah. Well, we've, um, we've been around for, oh, geez, six years. Yes. I think it's six years. Oops. <laughs> That's names and dates are my killer like i names are just it is is so bad it's so bad it's actually one of the symptoms too of adhd uh, a lot of people with adhd have a terrible time with names and recognizing faces which is a comorbid symptom um anyway so uh we are an organization um a volunteer run organize a uh, nonprofit and we support families of children with uh, disabilities and complex learners um, access and equitable education um, in BC. And so we started off um, during the uh, teacher strike a long time ago and um, Tracy had had started with a few of us and um, we had some really great uh, old school advocates there. Oh, I shouldn't say old school, maybe um, very experienced advocates who helped us along the way to um, figure out, navigate and bring people together because there was no real basis. There's no um, uh, there was nothing out there at the time. I mean, Facebook was just sort of there. We weren't using it as uh, a lot of organizations are using it a lot more now to connect with people because it's a really accessible way to connect. Um, so we use that and now we have uh, 3000 members, which is a good and bad thing um, because a lot of people come to us because they're having uh, challenges in the school system, advocating for the child. Um, we have now started an exclusion tracker for the past few years um, and that tracks um, exclusion incidences. Um, so where the child is being uh, told to go home, um, where the child can only come for a couple of days or a couple of hours a day. Um, there have, you know, there we hear all the stories. Um, and and unfortunately, because they come to us, a lot of them are very uh, uh, challenging stories uh, that you hear. And then, you, you, you know, a lot of us have actually experienced a lot of those things as well. And, you know, we hear stories where kids are coming half an hour a day um, to, edu to, to school. And, um, that is just not acceptable. We need to have our children educated, um, in any way that we can. Um, I'm not saying school is a be all end all the brick and mortar. I mean, heck I've got one kid in distributed learning and another one in, in brick and mortar. Uh, but we need to create a system that works for our children. Um, and not our children, you know, change our kids to fit into the system. And so, we try to help families advocate, but we also are trying to sit down with the government um, to create policy for change. Um, you know, talking to districts, 
um, having our conference every year, we um, educate parents on um, how to be a great advocate. We try to help educators understand more. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a really great, I, I love our conferences every year and it just ended a couple of weeks ago and um, I'm still a little hungover from that. <laughs> But it was such a great experience and so many great people. Thank you, Catherine, for coming on as well. Um, just a really great uh, presentation you did. Um, yeah, I was really, I got to rewatch that one again. Um, but yeah, so that's what we do. Um, and if you have anyone or know anyone that needs help, um, we are there. Um, Inclusion BC is there as well, uh, Family Support Institute. We are actually, um, we're all partner groups uh, with Inclusion BC. So we um, help each other and we um, support each other in helping our children. Um, and then they become adults, our kids. Um, and so we're trying to also help with self-advocacy. Um, so we partner up with BC People First um, to help out to get the word for their, they have a self-advocacy pamphlet out now um, for high school students. So that's something to look into. Um, if you have a high school student and you want to that child to learn more about what their rights are and and how for them to speak up for themselves, right? Because we want to be able to to um, not only speak for them, but one day for them to speak for themselves. Because here I am, a self advocate as an adult, and it's and it's I have no idea what I'm doing. So <laughs> I wish I would have learned that a long time ago in school. <laughs> I would have actually probably known I had ADHD back then. Um, yeah. There's so many markers now. I look back and I'm like, oh yeah, that's why I used to bring a big backpack full of stuff because I'd always forget something. So I just put it all in a bag. And my sister would, would laugh at me. She's like, oh yeah, the, you bring in the kitchen sink again, are you? And I'm like, yep, got to bring everything in case I forget. So yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Chantal. Um, thank you. I'd like to remind everyone to like the Garforth Education Facebook group, or sorry, Facebook page. And if you haven't done so already, please join the Garforth Education Educators group or the Garforth Education Parents group to continue to get more support through us online. Thank you so much for doing what you're doing. It is, it's a huge help. Thank you. And thank you for having